thank you. Um, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. So here is what I'm going to talk about uh, the present lecture. So first, uh, the paper, the ninth basically, I uh, you what the how to compute a fluid dynamical type of energy spectrum. Um, it shouldn't be split time stepping. It's not covered time stepping. So preparation methods. Uh, I'll tell you more what that is. Then I'll go on to talk about some other subjects, which is the, the finite temperature models, such as the uh, spectrally truncated gross pitayevsky and uh, de-aliasing and conservation and uh, some stochastic model. And then if I have enough time, I want to finish talking about a uh, little bit about helicity. So let me stress what will not be covered in these lectures. So I will not talk about Newton methods for stationary states, which are very useful to study critical velocities uh, for flows around obstacles or attractive back. And I will not talk about time stepping or details of spectral methods, okay? See, if anyone is interested in this um, stuff, uh, you can come and see me after and I can tell you the relevant references. So let's start with the basic notions. So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, okay? And it's all covered in the old paper with Caroline now. So uh, let me start f uh, quickly start with basic definition. So I would just like to stress the difference between a perfect fluid and a and the gross pitayevsky fluid. So perfect fluids are uh, idealization of uh, real fluids where you neglect uh, viscosity and, uh, and thermal conductivity. So actually quasi-perfect quasi flows happen around airplanes and the Euler equation are actually used to compute um, flow around airplanes. This is an example that, that I took from some engineering uh, site. So they actually use Euler equation. And uh, of course, this is not good on the boundaries and it, this is not good in the turbulent of the plane. But still, as the plane is especially designed to have a small turbulent wake and it's a very good way to compute the flow around an airplane. So uh, this is Euler equation. And when the thermodynamics um, degenerates from two variables to one, uh, then the flow is called uh, barotropic. So uh, barotropic Euler equation are like this. And uh, so barotropic just means that there is a, a relation between density and, uh, and pressure. And this system is obviously time reversible because there is no, no transport, I mean no um, diffusion. Okay, the Euler equation has two useful limits, the incompressible limit and the rotational limit, where you have only compressible mode. So let me look at variational approach. So there is a way to set up a variational principle for the Euler equation in general, but I will just look the comp uh, at the compressible case now. So, well, it's very simple. You introduce this Lagrangian, where uh, rho is the density and phi is the velocity potential. And it's easy to check that the Euler-Lagrange equation associated to this Lagrangian give you back the Euler equation, so continuity equation and, uh, and Euler equation in the form of a Bernoulli equation. And if you take the gradient of the Bernoulli equation, you are back to the <coughs> Euler equation. Now, some people say superfluids are fluids with zero velocity, uh, viscosity, but this is not really true because a superfluid, as you all well know, is uh, something that obeys an equation like that. So, okay, we've seen the equation many times. I don't have to talk much about it. I've just noted the Madlung transform, transforming the complex uh, wave function in terms of um, density, rho, and uh, velocity potential phi. And, um, well, I remind you that this uh, transformation gives, puts it into hydrodynamic form. You can see that very easily on the Lagrangian because if you take the standard Lagrangian for the gross pitayevsky equation and then uh, do the Madlung transformation within the Lagrangian, you get this uh, thing, which looks very much like the compressible Euler Lagrangian, except you have one extra term, which is uh, the so-called quantum pressure or whatever term. 
And, um, well, and as we've seen before, when um, you put a gross Pitayevsky equation in, into hydrodynamic form following the Madlung equation, one has to introduce a speed of sound and a coherence length to speak in a hydrodynamic language. And then you have the conservation equation and the Bernoulli equation with the extra uh, quantum pressure term. Okay. Then, um, a lot of people have showed you slides saying that the rotational of velocity is a zero because velocity is a gradient, but it is not true on a place where actually the density is zero. Well, in fact, if you want to write, um, that's the equation at the bottom, this is an exact equation for the rotation of the velocity field. So there is a, um, a Dirac delta term, which, is, uh, which lives on the vortex line. So obviously it's uh, not zero because there is this delta term. And uh, you might remember from your lectures in uh, classical electrodynamics that uh, these terms looks very much like the current distribution uh, where omega is the equivalent of the current density. So this is the current around the thin loop, okay? And in this analogy, the velocity is like the magnetic field. I don't know if that helps. Okay, so. I would like to remind you that uh, there are uh, some conserved quantities. Uh, I've just written them directly in terms of psi. You have the mass, the momentum, and the energy. So the conservation law um, is a consequence of the fact that DDT of each of the conserved quantity density is equal to a divergence. So when you integrate that over whole space, you get provided you throw away boundary terms or provided you are in periodic boundary conditions, you get conservation laws for mass, momentum, and energy. Uh, now I'm starting to talk about the useful algorithm. Uh, the point is that uh, uh, I want to clear some, defini some um, how to talk about things. So uh, this term was called kinetic energy. And it's natural to call that kinetic energy because it comes uh, from the Hamiltonian, from the kinetic energy of the one particle Hamiltonian. But however, if you use Madlung transformation, um, you, you can see that uh, the gradient of Psi uh, can be written as the sum of this term and uh, the term on the top. Okay, and the term on the top, we call it kinetic energy, and this one we call quantum energy. So this question uh, might be a little bit confusing, but um, for a fluid mechanical point of view, this has not the form of a kinetic energy, okay? Whereas this is like rho v square, it is really a kinetic energy. So this type of decomposition here um, is very nice in the sense that um, when you have access to the velocity now, you can separate a compressible, a compressible part and an incompressible part. And the cons compressible part will describe um, uh, wave-like motions, compression, uh, whereas the incompressible part will be associated to the incompressible flow around the vortex line. Um, Okay, and because each of these energies is written as a square, uh, when you actually you can actually use Parseval theorem and um, and um, write corresponding spectrum, which is very useful when you are doing turbulence, like uh, incompressible kinetic energy spectrum. That's where you expect to see Kolmogorov if you have a Kolmogorov-like regime. Yes. Yes. Uh, it was kind of new idea to do it on gross Pitayevsky. However, I had seen before that the, the kinetic energy term, which for a compressible fluid is always like rho v. Uh, people uh, in compressible flow have a, I don't remember how they call it, but they often use uh, to write that like one. 
and then you use Passover. This I stole from compressible flows. Okay. This is uh, obviously needed. I mean, uh, I think it was a new idea, but I'm not sure. You know, it's a such a simple idea that probably if you look carefully enough, you might find some. Okay, so just just uh, um, the algorithm. It's very easy to compute that because if you compute gradient phi, this is like um, gradient of square root of rho e to the i phi. Yes. So this is gradient square root of rho uh, e to the uh, plus i gradient phi uh, square root of rho e to the i phi. Yes. Uh, so basically, if you compute this in your code, and if you also compute something like uh, psi, uh, psi bar over square root of... Um, So this is like, um, this is e to the minus i phi. So basically, you just have to compute the gradient of phi and then multiply by that. And you separate the uh, real part and the imaginary part, and you have all that is needed. So it's a very straightforward to do. Okay. Okay, now initial data preparation. Now, the problem is we've seen that in the Spitajewski equation, you have both... Uh, vortex line dynamics and sound waves. Now, if you just um, put um, random initial condition or uh, some initial condition that you like, whatever, uh, in general, you will excite both. I mean, and now, if you want to study something like uh <coughs> incompressible turbulence, uh, well, in incompressible turbulence, you have no sound waves. So, what you want to generate? is uh, some kind of vortex array. Uh, and if possible, that will start uh, without uh, generating too much sounds. Uh, this kind of problem is well known, for instance, in the geophysics community, people who, who compute um, things like Rossby waves around the Earth. Well, they start the computation with some initial data coming from satellites and whatever. And they, they do have to do some data massaging, they call it, because if you put uh, uh, something with random perturbation, in general, you will excite many waves. So what I'm showing you now is a trick, a series of tricks, actually, uh, how to generate initial data that will nicely emulate a large-scale um, vertical flow. You know, that's the idea. So. Um, General algorithm, I might need to remind you what Klebsch potentials are. This is a well-known thing from uh, two centuries ago. Uh, Klebsch potential is when you have a velocity field, an incompressible velocity field. You write it like lambda gradient of mu minus gradient of phi. Okay, This is a Klebsch representation. And lambda and mu are called the Klebsch potentials. Okay. So uh, if you take the rotational of this thing, the curl, sorry, the curl is like this, okay? And uh, you can see at once that a generic 3D, and of course it's these conditions that determines uh, fire. So if I take this, I get uh, so this is a Poisson equation for phi, OK? So everything is determined. <coughs> you can see easily that a generic 3D incompressible uh, vector field cannot be represented like that, because you see here that <coughs> lambda and mu are first integrals of the motion around vortex lines. That is, if I write the system okay, then obviously 
this system, lambda and mu, are integrals. So the vortex lines, they live on the surface lambda equal constant and mu equal constant. So the intersection of the surfaces lambda equal constant, mu equal constant are the vortex lines. Now this, in general, is not possible because uh, generically a 3D, 3D field uh, divergence less will have chaotic vortex lines, okay? And this uh, tells you the vortex lines are not chaotic, so in general it will not work. However, for a good number of flow it works. And there is a simple way, I'll just explain it here. So if I look at the map, uh, lambda and mu gives me a map from uh, the space into the lambda mu plane, yes? So you see that a vortex line in the space in, is mapped into a point in lambda mu space, okay? And also, um, the integral like that of lambda d mu minus mu d lambda, if I integrate there, that around a curve, it is um, the circulation against the vortex cube tube corresponding to this, okay? So now, whenever you have a vortex representation, um, Klebsch representation of a classical f uh, field, it's very easy to generate a vortex array that will have the same circulation at the vortex field by putting topological defects, that is a complex zeros, in the lambda mu plane. Okay, so that's the idea of the Klebsch method. And I just show you here how it works in the case of the Taylor Green vortex. So this is the Taylor Green vortex, which is a classical flow that has been used for many, many years in, uh, in classical turbulence to, to do numerical simulation of uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equation and study turbulence. So it's a reference flow for turbulence. It also looks very much like uh, von Karman flow, because if you if you look at this flow, it's like the flow between two counter-rotating uh, eddies. And uh, it turns out that this flow admits a Klebsch representation, which is like that. You can check that if you take lambda and mu and compute v, it works. And so then the trick is to define uh, some function of lambda and mu. Uh, and then, I mean, you have to read the paper to see the... the details, but the, the idea is this. And so by doing this trick and uh, putting it an array like that, you get <coughs> a 3D vortex array that looks very much like the Telegreen vortex. Now, this is not enough because there is second element in the preparation method, which many of you have maybe heard in terms of imaginary time evolution. So this is the kind of preparation data messaging to avoid emission of too much um, too much um, sound waves uh, it can be justified and it is justified in the old paper by saying that if you have only a single vortex line and if what you want is to get a single vortex line uh, with a given velocity so this is a Galilean land transformation so in the case of the velocity is constant then you can show that this equation will converge to the good single vortex line with the correct boost velocity. So now if you think that this uh, external velocity field is slowly varying with respect to the vortex line bundle, then you see that local it will do something okay. And anyway, so this is a nonlinear diffusion, equ diffusion advection equation. So when you integrate it, it will uh, converge. Uh, typically exponentially in time to some steady state. And when, when you have the steady state, that's it. You have your initial data for Gross-Pitayevsky. And you take this initial data and put it in Gross-Pitayevsky, and it works uh, fairly well. Okay, so, for instance, I'll show you here a preview uh, from my talk next week where uh, you see how, I mean, these curves are very nice in the sense that you see the incompressible kinetic energy is behaving just like the incompressible kinetic energy in a um, very high Reynolds number Navier-Stokes uh, turbulent uh, Taylor-Green run, whereas the compressible energy is uh, 
staying low. So this shows that it works. You are not generating a lot of uh, com compressible waves and you are following a dynamic that is very much like the Navier-Stokes. So, and uh, here is one of the spectra that I think, I'm not sure if Carlo showed this one on the ABC spectrum. Yes? Yes. Some waves, some, some, some wave generation. Yeah, but the point is if you don't do all these uh, nice tricks I've shown you, instead of uh, having this uh, small thing like that, you, you get a huge, uh, much, much, much bigger thing like that. that that's the whole point. Huh? Okay, I have a guess, but I'm not sure I want to try, that maybe we could add an extra term to, th to this equation, which would be a max square correction to get the correct compressible pressure. Uh, I don't know. But it's in practice, it's very, very small. I mean, look at the number. I, it's just showing you that you have a small, uh, small waves oscillating. This is typically the, the size of the box. So it's some mismatch between density and the array of vortices. Okay, and uh, what you are really happy with is when you get things like that, which, I mean, it shows that you do have a K-minus 5 third regime, and that's typically how they are. So to get this kind of plots, there is the two tricks together, the three tricks, uh, how to compute the energy spectrum, uh, how to prepare the initial data uh, in two steps with Klebsch and then uh, imaginary time advective argon, okay? And, <sighs> yes? Yes. Okay, so for instance in the so your R3 flow is mapped to the lambda plane. So there is some amount of total circulation in the lambda mu plane. Uh, for Taylor Green, I think it's for some number. And now, uh, when you increase your resolution, you can decrease the coherence length. Now, uh, velocity of Taylor Green flow is of order one. The max velocity is one. So if you want to run at, say, a Mach number of one half, uh, you will set C equal to two, okay? So then you see that when you, or you set the velocity of sound to some value so that your Mach number is small enough, okay, for you. Then you set the length of uh, the, co the um, healing length, you set it to be something uh, slightly larger than one mesh size. Then you, you set C psi of a square root of 2, which is the quantum of circulation. Actually, 4 pi C psi of a square root of 2 is the quantum of circulation. Now, here we have 4. Suppose I'm saying uh, whatever that uh, when you are running 2,000 cube, this is um, uh, 1 uh, over 500. Then it, me it means you have to put 1,000 vortices here. That's the way it's done. Okay? So the more resolution, the more vortices. Um, okay, I, I want to give a um, correction now. It's not a correction, it's another example, because all this thing was working only when you had Klebsch potential. So that doesn't mean that you are dead if uh, you have no Klebsch potential. A and I want to show you the example of the ABC flow. So, okay. Um, Remember, it was two parts. First part, prepare some initial data for the imaginary time evolution. And second, do the imaginary time evolution. So the problem we, ha we have with ABC is not, uh, is not the imaginary time evolution. This will work. is to generate the initial uh, condition for the imaginary time evolution that has the proper vortices. And why do we have a problem? Because this flow, this ABC flow, which, by the way, is uh, another reference flow in a classical 
turbulence. It's a V reference flow uh, for turbulence with helicity. Well, it is well known, and it's a flow that depends on three numbers, A, B, a, B and C, and it's called the arnold beltrami childress flow. Uh, because it was considered by both Arnold and Childress and Beltrami, because it's, um, this thing is a Beltrami flow in the sense that it's an eigenvalue of the um, rotation of the curl operator. Th this flow, if you compute its curl, you will get something proportional to the flow. Okay? So in some sense, it's maximally helical. And it's well known in the literature that the vortex lines of this flow for selected values of ABC are chaotic. They have chaos, so there is no cleft representation. However, we can still do something because if you take, for instance, B and C equals zero, what do you get? You get uh, V, uh, I should put it over here. You get V equals, how is it? Is it VX and VY? Uh, God. I'm lost. Uh, if I have only A equal non-zero, X is zero, so it's VY equals sine X and VZ equals sine Y. So it's zero, sine X, and cosine Y, I guess. Uh, cosine Y. Yes? This is the case where A equal 1, B equals 0, C equals 0. It's like this. So if you think of it, it's <coughs> a constant flow that is perpendicular to the x-axis. And when you, uh, no, it's, sorry. It's x here, right? Yes. So that is perpendicular to the x-axis. And when you are moving along the x-axis, it is rotating like that while being perpendicular, yes? So in a given place, it is a const at a given x location, it's a constant flow in a direction. Now, a constant flow in a direction, <coughs> we know how to do, uh, we know what it should be using that look. It should be just a plane wave going in that direction, okay? But if I want to be um, if I want to be periodic, I have to take whole values here. So, by taking this thing, I make a flow that is uh, a little bit messy, that has the correct distribution of momentum of the basic A flow, which is uh, a flow that is going perpendicular to um, to the x-axis and the direction rotating when I go from x equals 0 to x to, to pi. I get this, something like this. Then I can do the same thing in y and z and uh, multiply all of them together. And I have an approximation, which is uh, kind of bad because it will have uh, periodic defects, etc. But I can put that in the imaginary time evolution, and it does converge. So <sighs> there is a nice trick here. Is I told you, the original the original uh, vortex lines are chaotic. So the vortex line in, in gross pitayevsky equation cannot be chaotic, okay? Because there are zero field. So they will do some approximation of the chaotic lines, and we are getting the best uh, approximation possible. So this is a result of the procedure. So this is for some value, uh, the initial data you get. And again, when you use this, uh, I'll show this next week. When you use this as um, initial data for the GP thing, you get what you want. That is, um, this time it will be an uh, energy and helicity cascade and uh, very little uh, sound wave emission. So it's a trick that works. Okay, so I'm through with my first subject. How much time do I have left? I have three subjects, two, uh, two more. Oh. I have to accelerate a little bit because I've spent half my time on one third. Okay, so the truncation of GP. So this was done some time ago with Giorgio, and it's um, in this paper. And basically it's about uh, uh, using spectrally truncated uh, Gross-Pitayevsky equation um, 
to model finite temperature effects. So let me go quickly through that. Um, definition of truncation. Well, if you are running with a spectral code, you already uh, have uh, some truncation going on because your wave number is limited by the amount of resolution you have. Okay. Uh, the the so-called truncation or projection thing is to take this uh, ex explicitly into account in the um, in the equation. So I def we define here PG, which is a proje uh, projector operator that will put to zero all the wave all the modes that have wave number larger than some given value, and um, we put it like that in the equation. Now there are some tricks. I don't have time to get into it, but the point is that it's not that intuitive, but if you don't put them exactly like that and you use a two-third de-aliasing, uh, then it turns out you do not uh, conserve uh, momentum. Uh, actually, a lot of colleagues use truncated schemes in which they have thermalized solutions. Some people even use finite different approximations but they use schemes where momentum is not conserved in the truncated system. And however, they use this to study, for instance, uh, how much momentum is transferred from the, uh, from the thermal state to a vortex ring that's moving. So how can you study momentum transfer between two objects if total momentum is not conserved? This is uh, strange to me. So if you do it like that, every conservation law is valid in the truncation system. So just I give some justification about what these truncated systems are. So the, the idea is that basically the wave excitation around Gross-Pitayevsky in an ideal physical world, uh, they are uh, phonons and they are quantized. I mean, they obey Bosenstein uh, statistics. However, if you are at a temperature such that their occupation number is very large, you can treat them as uh, classical variables and look at the mm, thermal equilibration of these classical variables. So that's the idea of classical field models. Uh, and uh, then you can understand that uh, with a black body analogy. That is, uh, this is the well-known black body law. And, um, the genes part can be understood as a classical field model. I mean, that's the idea, okay? So, uh, in the real physics, you have a law like that, but what you are going to do on your computer is to say, okay, I will put a maximum wave number here, and I will keep only the first part. So, if you look at the literature uh, of finite temperature models of Bose-Einstein condensation, you find that among many, many models, this is one of the standard models to do things. So it's good for some things, uh, not so good for other things, etc. And uh, it's been studied in the literature. I mean, it's been known for a long time in the literature uh, by uh, Davis here in 2001, I think, that if you integrate uh, truncated gross pitayevsky equation for a long, long, long time, then it will converge to some statistical equilibrium, okay? And uh, they even saw that in this statistical equilibrium, there was a um, condensation transition at a critical energy, and above this energy, you had no condensate, and below this energy, uh, you had con condensate. So, so okay, th there are some other things we did with Giorgio. Uh, I will just mention here an algorithm so that you can um, generate uh, the thermalized state. So what is the idea? I give you the algorithm here. It looks kind of horrible, but uh, I don't want to go into the details here. I just want to tell you that this is again an imaginary time evolution with no advection this time. And there is a white noise in the right hand side. So it's a stochastic differential equation. So now it's demonstrated in the paper that this stochastic, this stochastic differential equation uh, it's, uh, will converge to an equilibrium probability that is the canonical, grand canonical distribution corresponding to the gross pitayevsky hamiltonian So uh, in terms of statistical mechanics, 
the gross Pitayevsky thermalization is a microcanonical thermalization. You start with a given energy, given mass, given momentum. You move forward conserving all the three things and it finally thermalizes. So it's micro And this stochastic differential equation will go to the equivalent canonical thing, uh, ensemble. So grand canonical. Grand canonical is equivalent to the micro canonical for practical purposes if you have a large enough uh, numbers of degrees of freedom. And we checked in this paper that for uh, runs with resolution 32, even it was already uh, both ensembles has had very quasi identical uh, statistical property. So, okay. So you have, let me just mention that it's an interesting thing about this uh, truncated gross Pitayevsky model is that I if you look at the grand canonical um, uh, probability distribution, this is just the standard distribution that was used in the 70s by the standard uh, second order phase transition description with renormalization group, you know, Wilson-like, etc. So you can see that this condensation transition in the truncated gross Pitayevsky equation is exactly uh, the good model that is actually used to extract the critical exponents, etc. for uh, real physical helium. Okay, so I don't have time to go into mutual friction. And I will just, one more algorithm I wanted to mention that can be very useful is a spatial temporal spectrum. So you've seen already uh, several sp uh, sp spatial temporal spectrum, but uh, what I want to say is that if you have a big code that is computed solutions to gross Pitayevsky equation, it's actually quite easy to extract from a simulation um, uh, spatial temporal spectrum. The way you do this is just um, so you don't want to output all your database because that if you output it in time, this will generate an enormous amount of data, but you can decide to output it at given times in on a subset of your wave numbers. So let's say on a line, or on a surface, and you can output every few time step uh, slice of your Fourier mode and store them somewhere, okay? And you go on doing this, so you have a, a database of uh, Fourier modes evolution in time. And then what you can do is you can take a Fourier transform in time, so you have to take some precaution like people do in signal processing, that is before taking the Fourier transform in time, you have to multiply by some window so that the data is reasonably uh, periodic. And when you do that, uh, you end up with uh, what is called a spatial temporal spectrum. So it's kind of easy to do. Now, I just want to show you um, how useful it can be about, so I explained that, spatial temporal outputs and data windows and then Fourier transform in time. And I give you an example, which is, um, so this is a Taylor Green turbulent simulation. Uh, we've extracted here one of the vortex, and you see that it is kind of wiggly. So therefore, you would like to say, hmm, it's probably Kelvin waves that are excited. So how can you tell if Kelvin waves are present or not on the energy spectrum? Well, it's kind of difficult because they are mixed up with everything else. But if you look at the type of waves you have in your system, you have the density waves which follow Bogolyubov dispersion relation, and you have the Kelvin waves that follow this kind of dispersion relation, then you can distinguish one from the other looking at um, time resolved spectrum, which is kind of useful. Okay, and you can even do more, which is on, on the on the time um, resolved spectrum, so it's something like uh, a function of k and omega, and you, you've got your waves and uh, your things like that. So if you integrate over omega like that, you get the uh, one uh, time spectrum. It's integrated like that. Now, if you have one dispersion relation here and another one here, and you are interested about these guys, you can filter out this one and then do the integral and then you can reconstruct a spatial spectrum of uh, only this branch. This was what was done here, so extracting the Kelvin wave branch. 
And again, you see that the data seems to be closer to the Nazarenko Lvov uh, uh, prediction than to the COSIX V2 of 1. This is not a proof, but it goes into the, uh, this direction. Okay. Now I'm on with my last uh, topic. Okay, but it's longer than the other ones. So it's about helicity uh, in quantum turbulence, and it corresponds to this thing. So you, you what is helicity? Well, Carlo talked about helicity. It's a classical notion. That's the integral of <coughs> the velocity and the vorticity. And this is conserved from topological, uh, for topological reason. Actually, it does not depend on the precise form of the right-hand side of Euler equation. For instance, in uh, magnetohydrodynamics, you have an equation for, you have an extra term, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but the equation for B, uh, helicity is still conserved in the equation for B, so it's, it's really purely topological, okay? And now, what about helicity in quantum flows? So here you see you have a problem, which is that the vorticity is a distribution, which is well defined in the distribution sense, but it's singular on the vortex lines. And on the other hand, the velocity itself, if you look at the velocity, this is uh, another way to write Madelung's transform. Um, the velocity is the imaginary part of the gradient of psi divided by psi. So whenever you have a zero of psi, there is a one over r singularity. The velocity is diverging, and it's diverging on the line. So again, the vorticity has a delta, uh, Dirac delta, along the line. And the velocity has a 1 over r singularity perpendicular to the line. So, uh, well, you cannot multiply them just like that because you know you cannot multiply a singular distribution. But there is a sign that is okay, which is that their main singularity are orthogonal to each other. So there might be some way out of it. So uh, the idea is that as h is omega, times z, it's in fact the velocity that needs to be regularized because omega is a very well-defined distribution that tells you basically that the helicity is the integral of velocity along the line. So what we need is, that's by the way what people call center line helicity, which is uh, compute the, ve the, uh, the integrate the um, velocity along the line. That's the center line helicity. So really what we need to know is what velocity along the line. So the idea is that velocity is defined like this, and uh, both quantity, both the gradient and, um, and the field go to zero when you are along the line. So if you want to compute the velocity along the line, you get zero over zero. And the idea, because the gradient in the direction of the line is zero, of course, because uh, it's zero. So you, you have zero over zero, and the idea is to use L'Hopital. So when you do that, you get some expression, but I would rather explain it in a geometrical term. So the, the general formula for the velocity is that it's the gradient of the phase. So if you think of the constant phase surfaces, the velocity is just a gradient. Now, the problem on the vortex line is that the constant phase surface intersect on the line. So the gr gradient diverges like 1 over r. But now if you want to know how the phase is varying along the line, then you have a very easy way to do it, is to see how the equal, equal phase surface are turning when you go along the line. This is the result of applying L'Hopital rule. And um, it gives you a regularized value of um, parallel velocity in terms of a higher order derivative, one order higher, applying L'Hopital rule. Okay. So when you do this, you are happy. And in fact, if you know a little uh, topological fluid dynamics, you know that there is something called the Rye, something else called the twist, and that there are theorems like that. And then you can check that it, it, it indeed works out. And um, well, having do done all of this, uh, you have the problem of how to how to test it. So for that, you need to use knots. So the question is, yes?
Yes. the twist of the equal face surfaces. Yes. So center line helicity is equal to the twist of the equal face surfaces. That's another way to compute it I in a gross Pitayevsky thing. Okay? Let, let, let me, uh, if you, I, I can, uh, t uh, where, where, yeah, I can tell you what's going on. I, in a classical fluid, you don't have a vortex line, you have a vortex tube. So in a classical fluid, the vortex tube itself can have a twist. And this comes into play into the helicity. But here, we have a single vortex line that has no, the line is not twisted. If you want to emulate the twist of a vortex tube, you have to take a bunch of vortex line and twist it, but then this will be counted as link. Uh, anyway, there is a general theorem that says that the sum is the same, etc. So the point is that we are missing here one of the three things, and that's why it's not conserved in gross as a matter of fact. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to say how to prepare a knot. So here, <coughs> um, the, the general method has been devised uh, by, by people in the room, but I just wanted to add that we have uh, just one special thing here, is that the general method was devised here. Uh, what we did more was two details. One is to use the imaginary time evolution, and to use the imaginary time evolution you five? To use the imaginary time evolution, you need, um, you need to have the velocity. I'm just going to tell you how you compute the velocity. Well, it's uh, very easy. I'll do it over here. Okay. It's very easy because you have this formula telling you that the velocity, the vorticity, which is the Laplacian, the curl of the velocity, is equal to integral uh, dr, uh, let's call it dr ds uh, delta of x minus r of s ds, okay? Uh, this you can write in Fourier space. Uh, I, I mean, using the representation of delta in Fourier space, you can see that in Fourier space, omega is going to be the integral of dr over ds e to the i k x minus r of s um, ds. Yes, that's just taking the... And this, you can estimate uh, wave number by wave number. You compute this integral, and then you get the velocity periodized and everything. And then you can, uh, sorry, you get the vorticity. But by solving Poisson equation, which is very easy in Fourier, you get the velocity. And once you have the velocity, you can use their trick, which is to integrate some extra equation, I don't have time, to generate the wave function with the correct nodal lines and the correct phase. And then you can use the arg. And when you do that, you, you generate things like that. So I give you two examples here. One is a two link rings, the other one is a trefoil knot, but you can do whatever shape you want. The, the algorithm will work for any knot. And you can then put that inside gross pitayevsky equation, and again you get vortex line dynamics with n without much sound emissions. And uh, you can now use the regularized helicity to see what happens to helicity. Okay, I'm almost finished. Um, I had some more material, but let me just um, quickly summarize it. It's just going back to the ABC, uh, because we are talking about helicity. I wanted to show you, okay, this thing, and then I think I'll stop. So this thing is the evolution of energy and helicity in an ABC flow, uh, compared with Navier-Stokes, which is the dashed line, and Gross-Pitayevsky at various resolutions. So you see that 
qualitative, two things I want to say. One, qualitatively it works, you get the same type of behavior, but then there are many things to study. But I mean, in the helicity itself is behaving correctly. And second, in this flow, which instead of having a single knot, I had something like a few thousand knots. That's, that's the con initial condition. Well, then I don't need the niceties of regularized helicity. If I just brutally compute the unregularized helicity and I compare to the regularized, I have so much helicity in the flow <coughs> that there is no, I get it directly. And let me so finish by showing that I think Carlos showed these plots where you see, uh, it, it was with this flow that it was done, where you see the two k minus phi third, one uh, attributed to Kolmogorov and the other one attributed to a Kelvin wave cascade. And I think, okay, and that's it. <laughs>